this project is very different from what we just heard about. Now, it's a, a European-based research project between Durham University, uh, the Archaeological Research Institute in Bebracht in France, and uh, the University Complutense in Madrid. And originally it was all about opera. It was archaeologists who loved opera getting together and thinking about how do we protect landscapes containing opera. How do we work with the farmers who farm over the top of these opera? How do we get together and basically do what archaeologists like to do, protect our loved monuments? But from that, that actually morphed into something completely different. And not that the opera have been forgotten, but the shift has certainly moved away from it being about looking at the opera landscapes with the focus being on the opera, to being more about a focus on the stakeholders who are trying to manage these landscapes. So what are all the different levels that are involved? The farmers, the tenant farmers, the local residents, the wildlife group. So actually, how does this work? And the opera are only part of the management story. So it's become a much more level playing field. And one of the things that we realized within this process was basically how, as this was a European project, and we were looking at the concepts from the European Landscape Convention, but everything to do with stakeholders within the European Landscape uh, Convention isn't really happening. So what do I mean? Basically, we'll get through the boring part quickly. Article 5C suggests that the procedures for the participation of the general public, local and regional authorities, and other parties with an interest in the definition and implementation of landscape policy. So basically, that there should be people, not just authorities, not just the top dogs, normal people should be engaged in this process. And that these, you know, they shouldn't just be, this is the key point, the traditional management stakeholders, the ones who get engaged, are, you know, by the government in the UK, we've got DEFRA, we've got National, uh, Natural England. So how do we get in touch with those other stakeholders? How do we integrate their voices and their opinions? Because they do have an impact on these landscapes. And if they are not aware of how these landscapes are being managed, then they can't contribute to their sustainability. Does sustainability even mean anything to them? Does the word cultural landscape even mean anything to them? So if we want to create a management of our cultural landscapes, whether they contain opera or not, that is successful and sustainable and that people can care about and engage with in the future, then we need to think about different kinds of stakeholders and look at this beyond traditional uh, active stakeholders, if you like, to the more passive ones who just live in and around and work in these landscapes. So, as we're saying, in practice, policy making generally goes to the top. We have big national meetings. You get the NF NFU people there to represent the farmers. You get some HE people there to represent the archaeology. But actually, the people on the ground living there, the farmers who are working day to day in these landscapes, their views aren't represented. So, action is happening. I mean, um, we've got lots of pan European projects starting to look at these ways that we can engage with stakeholders at different levels from the beginning. Um, so we've got the Refit project, which is the one I'm going to talk about today, the Mamola project, which is again pan-European Labex item, which works in France, and of course Cherryscape, which I haven't put on there, but that comes out of Newcastle. So all of these things are starting to happen um, with the aim of trying to build in this greater uh, strength of working with a wider range of stakeholders within the ELC and just general best practice for landscape management. So the REFIT project stands for Resituating Europe, Europe's First Towns. Now we've really moved away from that, but that was the original idea. Um, and so as I said, EU funded collaborative project between the UK, France and Spain. And it was trying to take an ecosystem services approach to looking at cultural landscapes. So how do we integrate the natural change, the human action? How can we translate this into functioning management practice? And how key can we get stakeholders' voices, a better, wider range involved in this process? Do we actually need to? What are the benefits? So yes, we had our opera landscape, landscapes. They're still wonderful. We have shifted away from that a bit. But, um, and key for the UK example now, of course, is thinking about this in a post-Brexit context. Are our approaches to cultural landscape going to ma ma man maintain? Are we going to move away from stewardship? What will we have? So working with our different kinds of stakeholders on the ground now actually quite, could be quite good planning 
for putting forward new strategies if things are going to change. We know that the government's already thinking about how they're going to change direction. Where's the money going to come from? Who's going to manage it? Will it be more localised? So decentralisation. So all of these things, certainly in the UK context, could be quite interesting. And that's what I'm going to focus on now, just the UK examples. Um, but just in terms of the general methodology, what we tried to do within our four OPERDA landscapes was take all the different stakeholders. So yes, we did work with traditional active management stakeholders. We worked with you know, local governments. We worked with big uh, wildlife bodies, farming bodies. But also, we took it down to the next level, the residents, the tenant farmers, volunteers, all of these kinds of people. And so how did we work with them? We started off with perception studies. So we put out large surveys. Do you know what a cultural landscape is? What does sustainability mean to you? Do you know how said landscape, Badgend and Salmonsbury, is managed? How do you think it should be managed? So we did surveys, just general um, online ones, but also we focused down and did lots, hundreds of interviews with different stakeholders, tenant farmers, school teachers, we'll get to those in a minute, some people who are in this room as well. Um, and that also involved not question and answer, but mapping. Here is your cultural landscape. This is Bad and General Salmonsbury. Where do you see the boundaries? What features would you mark out as being important within this landscape? So trying to draw out the different values that people attach to these landscapes. With that data collected, the idea was to develop engagement activities that would help people think about these landscapes differently. So if you're a farmer and you're thinking about your crop yield, you might be thinking about your wild birds from your stewardship schemes. How can we get the farmers to engage with this ephemeral archaeology? How can we get the archaeologists to maybe think differently about what your visitors want? What about the wildlife people? How do we try and engage people on all the different aspects? So what kind of events could we run that would change people's perceptions of landscapes so we could take off our blinkers and, as archaeologists, only think about the opera and actually start to see the rest of the story? And then, in theory, we will do some. We haven't finished the project yet. Summative evaluation. How has this all worked? Has anyone's perceptions changed? Have we actually come up with any new and more integrated methods of managing cultural landscapes? And do they have implications and wider use beyond our four lovely opera, which hopefully they will? So the key aims, assess how our stakeholders define and value and perceive these landscapes, evaluate how they perceive them and how they engage currently with landscape management, if at all, especially if they're not what we would call an active landscape manager, if they're a resident. Um, how do we connect these different values together? How do you get a farmer to understand your wildlife or your archaeologist's values? Because that's so important if you want to work together to manage a landscape <coughs> in a sustainable way. So basically, yes, to then build on all of this and to try and find the best way to engage and integrate these values, accepting that there's never a perfect world. There will always be compromises. There will always be trade-offs. But until you understand each other, you're not going to go anywhere. <coughs> So, this is just brief. So, we had our focus for the UK was in the Cotswolds, the beautiful Cotswolds, Badgenden and Salmonsbury, two different kinds of opera, two different management contexts. Badgenden is a village, piecemeal management, farmer here, tenant farmer there, residents. Um, you know, the opera is practically invisible. Even the first time I went there, you know, it, you took a bit of imagination to bring it back to life. Salmonsbury is completely different in that it's managed by the Gloucester Wildlife Trust. So they have a holistic management strategy and their strategy sees beyond the boundaries of their wildlife reserve. So they have an enclosed oppidum. They also have, of course, um, they have a triple SI. They have a working farm as well with an organic dairy farm. They have public events, education. So they actually sort of epitomise the whole concept of the ELC in terms of taking a holistic approach. So we had two, although they're only a few kilometres apart, two very different types of management of cultural landscapes that have some similarities. Um, so these are some of the stakeholders that we worked with who you might call the less active. They're not um, necessarily the ones that would be called on by Natural England or DEFRA if you're going to have a stewardship consultation. But these voices are equally important and need to be engaged in management practices within cultural landscapes. We certainly need to 
figure out what are the values and perceptions of all of these different people um, if we're going to try and make management of cultural landscapes work sustainably. So, just some of the things that we pulled out of our interviews that you, I thought might be interesting for us to think about today. I'd love to hear your views in our discussion. So, cultural landscapes, what a horrible term. How many normal people have ever been asked, what is a cultural landscape? Have you ever heard of it? Most of my friends laughed when I even mentioned it to them and probably thought of all kinds of strange things. Um, so the majority of the people we worked with, many of whom were professionals as well as you know, residents and things like that, had never heard the term. Um, and when they thought about what a cultural landscape might be and drew on, on their maps, many perceptions were very, very small scale which doesn't necessarily work with how we currently try and manage landscapes. Um, but what was interesting was that while most people had never heard of this term, if you ask people what do you actually think a cultural landscape is, the majority of people had a good bash and understood this concept of needing to integrate natural and human actions and how they come together to shape the world, the landscapes that we see. So this is important because it suggests that the cultural landscape concept, even if we don't call it that because it's horrible and pretentious, um, has value in terms of being a way that we can start to integrate different values of different stakeholders. Um, so although you know, we may always think and it may seem that people just think about landscapes as natural, actually if you discuss this with people further, there is a realisation that human and natural action influence each other and shape the world around us. Um, so that's quite important. Um, but of course, the thing that was problematic for us was that seeing how the majority of people have a very small view. And therefore, if you're an archaeologist or a wildlife professional, you don't necessarily want to create a management strategy that is at the small scale. Um, you want to try and look across landscapes. So how do we deal with this sort of localism of perceptions and values of our non-traditional stakeholders, our local stakeholders, if you like, versus the sort of resources and management techniques that we normally take. So how can we mitigate this? Um, sustainability, now that was an easier one, but also provoked a lot of laughter. So asking people, you know, do you value sustainability within your landscapes? Of course, everyone said, or the majority, yes, we highly value the idea of sustainability. But what is sustainability? So there was a huge division there, the spectrum being from preserving things in aspic, especially if you talk about heritage, to people seeing the dynamism um, and the dynamic nature of landscapes and how they change. So this is a big challenge again. How do we reconcile this um, whole wide spectrum of views? Um, and maybe one way to do that is through archaeology. Because when you have an archaeological site, when you can explain to people what has happened somewhere in the past, you can actually demonstrate how landscapes are not static how they do change, how people have shaped them, how the lumps and the bumps, they weren't always there. So archaeology does have a powerful role in changing perceptions because if we want to manage landscapes, we need to appreciate that landscapes are dynamic, that they do change and that they need to change to be sustainable. But we need to be active in that change and archaeology can do that. But how can archaeology do that if like our two opera uh, in the Cotswolds most people have no idea they're even there. So there's a challenge. And that was one of the things we looked at in terms of engaging people, especially farmers, uh, local residents, with things like auguring. You may not be able to see anything on the surface. Take a soil core with an expert. We can talk you through 1,000, 2,000 years of the history of a landscape. You might not be able to see how the landscape has changed on the surface. You may not be able to see the human impact on the surface. But actually, in that core, we can talk you through the whole history. And then the farmers, the residents will think, who may originally have thought, what I do will have no impact on this landscape, will be able to see how, actually, not only them, but every previous generation, whether it is just from natural processes or a settlement or whatever, have shaped the landscape. And that's really powerful because it's something physical, You're not just walking someone around, giving them a talk about some lumps and bumps. They can do the core, they can get their hands on the soil, they can look at it under the microscope, see changing environment and human action, natural action shaping the landscape. So this is the kind of things we're looking at. How can we deal with these issues and bring different perceptions together? So. 
very complicated, is trying to communicate this idea that there are integrated cultural ecosystems. So there's been a lot of work um, already that sort of supports our research in terms of suggesting that this idea of sustainability that people get in different ways needs to be built on the connections between cultural and natural ecosystem services. Now, that's a difficult concept to communicate, and for this to succeed, you need all of your stakeholders at all levels, really, to appreciate this interrelationship. Um, and some stakeholders from our research obviously were aware of this, and this made people appreciate, whether it was the farmer or the archaeologist or the wildlife professional, that you need to compromise. There always has to be a trade-off. Never can every aspect of a landscape be managed equally. But if you don't understand the different perspectives, then you're not going to be willing to make these trade-offs. Um, still, generally, although there are a few who understand this point of view, most people had quite a narrow focus of their own concerns. Naturally, as a farmer, you're, you may be concerned with your, your farmland birds, of course, but your profit is what you need to survive, and there's nothing wrong with that. So the main thing that we saw was that where these trade-offs seem to work and where this compromise and this holistic approach was coming out was at the Salmonsbury site, uh, Greystones Farm, because the ethos of the Gloucester Wildlife Trust is holistic management. They have education schemes, they have an approach to badgers, they work with the archaeologists and somehow vaguely compromise, I'm not sure how well it works, maybe some of you have an opinion on that. Um, they have the triple SI, they have a profitable organic dairy farm. So there, what was interesting, not only did the staff, but the volunteers and a lot of the people who regularly visited the site had a completely different understanding of the landscape of Salmonsbury, Greystones Farm, than the people at Badgenden, where everything is very piecemeal. So it did start to suggest that if people do understand all the different interests, if they can see the active management of the different interests, that people are willing to accept compromise and that actually you can have a uh, central organiser, if you like, who brings people in, brings them together to create a management system that's more sympathetic to all the different aspects of a landscape. It's not easy, of course, and the Wildlife Trust are a charity. They're in a very privileged position. I appreciate this isn't possible in every landscape, but it shows that there are ways and means that this can be done that take into account the views of various stakeholders at all levels, from your visitors who come to walk your dog to your organic farmer, who's a tenant farmer, so all different levels going on there. Um, and there was evidence as well that other people who weren't necessarily quite so engaged also had a desire for more collaborative working. So the quote here, by working together as a community, we can find the best ways to work with and for the landscape. So there is a willingness, um, even on those who have never heard the term cultural landscape, who had never thought before about what was happening in the field. It just looked nice and green. They didn't realize it was green because it was covered in chemicals. So, you know, there are all these different things that we can think about. But of course, how do we communicate these different ideas? What's the best forum to share this information? So at the moment, of course, the main way that most of the UK is managed is through stewardship, or a great amount anyway, of the agricultural land. But that's fantastic, and stewardship does many wonderful things, as well as many not so wonderful things. But if the majority of the public have no idea that stewardship even exists, why would they value it? Why would they want to fund it? when we leave the EU? Why would anyone want to put any money into our rural landscapes if everyone thinks that they're natural and they just bumble along without the need for any help? So we need to think about how we're communicating, how we're managing our landscapes, and whether that's in terms of shine and what historic England is doing, how they're working with natural England, what's the public image? Um, and it was so interesting, because when we asked, you know, these are hundreds and hundreds of people how is the landscape currently managed? I think only about 10 people, most of whom were archaeologists or wildlife experts or work for Natural England, mentioned stewardship. So people have no idea. You know, triple SIs, yep. AOMBs, yep. 
but actually the way that most of the rural landscape we see exists and what's going on within it, nobody knows. Nobody knows that actually there are special components that protect the historic environment as well. Even a lot of the farmers hadn't realized because their land agents never told them. So this lack of communication means there's a huge problem in terms of connecting all the different management aspects. And of course, there are various problems with stewardship that we won't go into, but short-termism, um, certainly now maybe with Brexit it will be different but we maybe need to think about how can we change this how can we change the way that people perceive what's going on to show that these landscapes are actively managed they won't carry on looking lovely if we don't all get involved and roll up our sleeves and care about them so implications are quite straightforward really lack of awareness by many stakeholders um, and limited awareness of what other people think. And that leads to horrible uh, stereotypes. Well, farmers only care about money. Archaeologists just want to preserve everything. And they're not willing to let anything go. The wildlife people, they don't care about the badgers. They'll let them destroy everything. So we need to deal with that. And that's not actually the reality. You know, certainly professionals and even communities are aware that compromises need to be made. But we need to try and break down some of these stereotypes. And then, of course, disparities in scale. So most people within communities exist and think on a small scale within their own world, but we try and manage things often either at the micro level of a farm, that doesn't really work because if you've got one farm doing fantastic schemes and everything around it is doing nothing, that's not really going to do any good, or we try and do things at a huge scale which people just can't comprehend and it just doesn't work for individuals within communities. So. How do we reconcile this? And then, of course, where's the information? How do we start to communicate all these different layers that are taking place within our cultural landscapes? So knowledge exchange, that is clearly the key if we want to try and move forward and come up with more holistic approaches, or at least just have a wider range of people understand that landscapes need to be managed, that they are managed, that they don't just carry on looking green and lovely if we don't think about them and we don't care about them. So. Basically, yeah, more information. But of course, there is a lot of information already, but what are the issues? It's very jargonistic and it's also very separated into its different categories. If you know about wildlife, you know where to go. If you know about heritage, you know about shine. You know where to look. But actually, where do you look beyond your area of expertise? How do you even know where to go? Um, the idea of more localised management, so local landscape character assessments and things, this is starting to come to the fore, but you need management, otherwise you get one particular bandwagon or group with a particular interest going off and still everything else gets neglected. So how do we bring these different views together? How can we integrate and build more awareness? So. Obviously, integration is the key. It's not easy. It can work on the small scale, as we've seen at one of the examples at Greystones Farm. But the idea isn't that we need to resolve all tensions. We just need people to be aware of all of the different factors that are shaping these landscapes to create willingness to compromise and to appreciate other people's values. Um, and of course, if you're better informed, then you're more willing to make compromises because you understand what you're dealing with. Um, so, you know, just some very last thoughts. How could we do this? How can we aid this knowledge exchange? I mean, things like open farm days are brilliant to make the public come into farms, see that farms aren't only about making profit, to see that farms are about ha taking care of heritage sites. You know, why is this big lump not being mowed? Why aren't the cows allowed to graze on this mound? Oh, guess what? It's a, it's a burial mound, whatever. Or why have you left your meters margins around the edge of your fields? That's for the farming birds, the, what, the farm, farmland birds. So there are all these different ways that, just small things that can start to change perceptions. Obviously, you're not going to change everyone's mind with open farm days, but it's a start. Things like field signage. So uh, stewardship schemes, they used to put little plaques on the gates that said things like, this field is managed under stewardship. They're doing whatever it is they're doing. They cut that because obviously it costs money. But maybe that was actually quite useful because I met a lot of people who were living next to fields in stewardship, some of whom knew about stewardship, but had no idea and said things like, well, there's probably some stewardship schemes going on around here, but if they are, I can't see them and I don't know about them. So if you walked around your village every day and saw a sign that said, this field is managed for this, this field is under a you know, historic protection, blah, 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 
just small things that could start to help change perceptions. Um, workshops, of course, like our auguring, you know, actually get people hands-on involved. Um, and then something else we thought of, you know, with a lack of information, it's a digital age. Our last speakers gave a good presentation on that. <coughs> what about something like a landscape e-portal? Something that isn't just, this is the archaeology, this is the wildlife. Not something that needs to be loads of work built from scratch, but something can literally pull the resources together and the links so that your stakeholders, if they want to build an LLCA, or if they're just interested, can go to one portal. They want to find out about how the historic environment is managed. They can find out about Shine. They want to know how they can get involved uh, with volunteering. They can go to the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. These kinds of things to bridge gap and facilitate knowledge. So, key messages, pretty obvious. More informed and engaged stakeholders will help shape management strategies that are for the benefit of everyone. They'll create greater buy-in and it'll, the key is to facilitate awareness of other stakeholders' landscape values as well. Um, and if we have more information, we'll value our cultural and nat natural assets and understand how we can manage them more effectively at a local level. Um, of course, we need leadership. We always need leadership. Um, but it's only if we can integrate and make all this information more accessible um, and, and allow all kinds of stakeholders to engage with these landscapes that we might start to find ways that in or out of the EU not just Britain, but other countries in Europe and the world, can actually integrate their stakeholders and show real value um, for them and appreciate their values in order that people aren't under, uh, overlooked, which I think in the long term will be to the detriment of our communities, our landscapes and their history. Thank you. Just um, if you want to find out more, <laughs> there are all the links um, to the Refit project and my email. And there are references, but you don't need those. So I'll leave that up there for a second. Thank you.